Timur Persian Timur Timur Chagatai Timur the 9th of April 1336 to the 18th of February 1405 historically known as Amir Timur and Tamerlane Persian Timur Chung Timur I Lang Timur the Lame was a Turco-Mongol conqueror as the founder of the Timurid Empire in Persia and Central Asia he became the first ruler in the Timurid dynasty According to John Joseph Saunders Timur was the product of an Islamized and Iranized society and not steppe nomadic, born into the Barla's Confederation in Transoxiana in modern-day Uzbekistan on 9 April 1336, Timur gained control of the western Chagatai Khanate by 1370. From that base, he led military campaigns across western, south and central Asia, the Caucasus and southern Russia, and emerged as the most powerful ruler in the Muslim world after defeating the Mamluks of Egypt and Syria, the emerging Ottoman Empire, and the declining Delhi Sultanate. From these conquests, he founded the Timurid Empire, but this empire fragmented shortly after his death. Timur was the last of the great nomadic conquerors of the Eurasian steppe, and his empire set the stage for the rise of the more structured and lasting gunpowder empires in the 16th and 17th centuries. Timur envisioned the restoration of the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan died 1227. According to Beatrice Forbes Manns, in his formal correspondence Timur continued throughout his life to portray himself as the restorer of Chinggisid rights. He justified his Iranian, Mamluk, and Ottoman campaigns as a re-imposition of legitimate Mongol control over lands taken by usurpers. To legitimize his conquests, Timur relied on Islamic symbols and language, referred to himself as the Sword of Islam, and patronized educational and religious institutions. He converted nearly all the Borjigan leaders to Islam during his lifetime. Timur decisively defeated the Christian Knights Hospitaller at the Siege of Smyrna, styling himself a Ghazi. By the end of his reign, Timur had gained complete control over all the remnants of the Chagatai Khanate, the Ilkhanate, and the Golden Horde, and even attempted to restore the Yuan dynasty in China. Timur's armies were inclusively multi-ethnic and were feared throughout Asia, Africa, and Europe, sizable parts of which his campaigns laid to waste. Scholars estimate that his military campaigns caused the deaths of 17 million people, amounting to about 5% of the world population at the time. He was the grandfather of the Timurid Sultan, astronomer and mathematician Ula Beg, who ruled Central Asia from 1411 to 1449, and the great-great-great-grandfather of Babur, 1483 to 1530, founder of the Mughal Empire, which ruled parts of South Asia for over three centuries, from 1526 until 1857. Timur is considered as a great patron of art and architecture, as he interacted with intellectuals such as Ibn Khaldun and Hafiz Ayabru. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Ancestry. Through his father, Timur claimed to be a descendant of Tumanay Khan, a male line ancestor he shared in common with Genghis Khan. Tumanai's great-great-grandson Karachar Noyan was a minister for the emperor and was eventually transferred to assist his second son Chagatai in the governorship of Transoxiana. Though there are not many mentions of Karachar in 13th and 14th century records, later Timurid sources greatly emphasized his role in the early history of the Mongol Empire. These histories also state that Genghis Khan later established the bond of fatherhood and sonship by marrying Chagatai's daughter to Karachar. Through his descent from this marriage, Timur claimed kinship with the Chagatai Khans. The origins of Timur's mother, Tekina Khatan are less clear. The Zafranama merely states her name without giving any information regarding her background. Writing in 1403 Jean, Archbishop of Sultaniya claimed that she was of lowly origins. The Mu'is al-Ansab, written decades later say that she was related to the Yasawari tribe, whose lands bordered that of the Barlas. Ibn Khaldun recounted that Timur himself described to him his mother's descent from the legendary Persian hero Manachar. Ibn Arabshah suggested that she was a descendant of Genghis Khan. The 18th-century books of Timur identify her as the daughter of Sadr al-Shariya, believed to be referring to the Hanafi scholar Ubaid Allah al-Mabubi of Bukhara. Early life Timur was born in Transoxiana near the city of Kesh modern Sharasabs, Uzbekistan some 80 kilometers 50 miles south of Samarkand, part of what was then the Chagatai Khanate. 
His father, Teragai, was a minor noble of the Barlas, a Mongolian tribe that had been Turkified in many aspects. Historian Beatrice Forbes Manns believes that Timur may have later understated the social position of his father so as to make his own successes appear more remarkable. She states that though he is not believed to be especially powerful, Teragai was reasonably wealthy and influential. This is shown by Timur returning to his birthplace following the death of Teragai in 1360, suggesting concern over his estate. He is described by Arabsha as a magnate in the court of Amir Husayn Karunas. In addition to this the father of the great Amir Hamid Karid of Mogulistan is stated as a friend of Tarahai's. According to Gerard Chaliand, Timur was a Muslim, and he saw himself as Genghis Khan's heir. Though not a Borjigid or a descendant of Genghis Khan, he clearly sought to invoke the legacy of Genghis Khan's conquests during his lifetime. His name Timur means, iron. In the Chaghatay language, Timur's mother tongue cf. Uzbek Tamir, Turkish Demir. Later Timurid dynastic histories claim that he was born on 8 April 1336, but most sources from his lifetime give ages that are consistent with a birth date in the late 1320s. Historian Beatrice Forbes Manns suspects the 1336 date was designed to tie Timur to the legacy of Abu Sa'id Bahadur Khan, the last ruler of the Ilkhanate descended from Hulagu Khan, who died in that year. At the age of eight or nine, Timur and his mother and brothers were carried as prisoners to Samarkand by an invading Mongol army. In his childhood, Timur and a small band of followers raided travelers for goods, especially animals such as sheep, horses, and cattle. Around 1363, it is believed that Timur tried to steal a sheep from a shepherd but was shot by two arrows, one in his right leg and another in his right hand, where he lost two fingers. Both injuries crippled him for life. Some believe that Timur suffered his crippling injuries while serving as a mercenary to the Khan of Sistan in Khorasan in what is today the Dashti Margo in southwest Afghanistan. Timur's injuries have given him the names of Timur the Lame and Tamerlane by Europeans. Timur was a Muslim, possibly belonging to the Naqshbandi school of Sufism, which was influential in Transoxiana. However, his chief official religious counselor and advisor was the Hanafi scholar Abdu El Jabbar Khwarizmi. In Termid, he had come under the influence of his spiritual mentor Sayyid Baraka, a leader from Balkh who is buried alongside Timur in Gur i Amir. Timur was known to hold Ali and the Al Al Bayt in high regard and has been noted by various scholars for his pro Alid stance. Despite this, Timur was noted for attacking the Shia with Sunni apologism, while at other times he attacked Sunnis on religious ground as well. In contrast, Timur held the Seljuk Sultan Ahmad Sinjar in high regard for attacking the Ismailis at Alamut, while Timur's own attack on Ismailis at Anjudan was equally brutal. Personality Timur is regarded as a military genius and as a brilliant tactician with an uncanny ability to work within a highly fluid political structure to win and maintain a loyal following of nomads during his rule in Central Asia. He was also considered extraordinarily intelligent, not only intuitively but also intellectually. In Samarkand and his many travels, Timur, under the guidance of distinguished scholars, was able to learn the Persian, Mongolian, and Turkish languages. According to Ahmad ibn Arabsha, Timur could not speak Arabic. More importantly, Timur was characterized as an opportunist. Taking advantage of his Turco Mongolian heritage, Timur frequently used either the Islamic religion or the law and traditions of the Mongol Empire to achieve his military goals or domestic political aims. Timur was a learned king, and enjoyed the company of scholars, he was tolerant and generous to them. He was a contemporary of the Persian poet Hafez, and a story of their meeting explains that Timur summoned Hafiz, who had written a ghazal with the following verse, For the black mole on thy cheeky would give the cities of Samarkand and Bukhara. Timur upbraided him for this verse and said, By the blows of my well-tempered sword I have conquered the greater part of the world to enlarge Samarkand and Bukhara, my capitals and residences, and you, pitiful creature, would exchange these two cities for a mole. Hafez, undaunted, replied, It is by similar generosity that I have been reduced, as you see, to my present state of poverty. It is reported that the king was pleased by the witty answer and the poet departed with magnificent gifts. Timur used Persian expressions in his conversations often, and his motto was the Persian phrase Rasti Rusti, Rasti Arsti, meaning, Truth is safety, or Veritas Salis. Military leader 
About 1360, Timur gained prominence as a military leader whose troops were mostly Turkic tribesmen of the region. He took part in campaigns in Transoxiana with the Khan of the Chagatai Khanate. Allying himself both in cause and by family connection with Khazahan, the dethroner and destroyer of Volga Bulgaria, he invaded Khorasan at the head of a thousand horsemen. This was the second military expedition that he led, and its success led to further operations, among them the subjugation of Khwarezm and Urgench. Following Kazagan's murder, disputes arose among the many claimants to sovereign power. Tula Timur of Kashgar, the Khan of the Eastern Chagatai Khanate, another descendant of Genghis Khan, invaded, interrupting this infighting. Timur was sent to negotiate with the invader but joined with him instead and was rewarded with Transoxania. At about this time, his father died and Timur also became chief of the Birlas. Tula then attempted to set his son Ilyas Koja over Transoxania, but Timur repelled this invasion with a smaller force. <inaudible> Rise to power It was in this period that Timur reduced the Chagatai Khans to the position of figureheads while he ruled in their name. Also during this period, Timur and his brother-in-law Amir Husayn, who were at first fellow fugitives and wanderers in joint adventures, became rivals and antagonists. The relationship between them began to become strained after Husayn abandoned efforts to carry out Timur's orders to finish off Ilya Koja, former governor of Mawarana, close to Tishnet. Timur began to gain a following of people in Balkh, consisting of merchants, fellow tribesmen, Muslim clergy, aristocracy and agricultural workers, because of his kindness in sharing his belongings with them. This contrasted Timur's behavior with that of Husayn, who alienated these people, took many possessions from them via his heavy tax laws and selfishly spent the tax money building elaborate structures. Around 1370, Husayn surrendered to Timur and was later assassinated, which allowed Timur to be formally proclaimed sovereign at Balkh. He married Husayn's wife Saray Molk Kanem, a descendant of Genghis Khan, allowing him to become imperial ruler of the Chaghatay tribe. One day Aksak Timur spoke thusly, Khan Zude in China rules over the city. We now number 50 to 60 men, so let us elect a leader. So they drove a stake into the ground and said, we shall run thither and he among us who is the first to reach the stake, may he become our leader." So they ran and Aksak Timur, as he was lame, lagged behind, but before the others reached the stake he threw his cap onto it. Those who arrived first said, We are the leaders. But, Aksak Timur said, My head came in first, I am the leader. Meanwhile, an old man arrived and said, the leadership should belong to Aksak Timur, your feet have arrived but, before then, his head reached the goal." So they made Aksak Timur their prince. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimization of Timur's rule Timur's Turco-Mongolian heritage provided opportunities and challenges as he sought to rule the Mongol Empire and the Muslim world. According to the Mongol traditions, Timur could not claim the title of Khan or rule the Mongol Empire because he was not a descendant of Genghis Khan. Therefore, Timur set up a puppet Chaghatay Khan, Suyurgatmish, as the nominal ruler of Balkh as he pretended to act as a protector of the member of a Chinggisid line, that of Genghis Khan's eldest son, Hochi. As a result, Timur never used the title of Khan because the name Khan could only be used by those who come from the same lineage as Genghis Khan himself. Timur instead used the title of Emir meaning general, and acting in the name of the Chagatai ruler of Transoxania, to reinforce his position in the Mongol Empire. Timur managed to acquire the royal title of son in law when he married a princess of Chinggisid descent. Likewise, Timur could not claim the supreme title of the Islamic world, caliph, because the office was limited to the Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. Therefore, Timur reacted to the challenge by creating a myth and image of himself as a supernatural personal power," ordained by God. Since Timur had a successful career as a conqueror, it was easy to justify his rule as ordained and favored by God since no ordinary man could be a possessor of such good fortune that resistance would be seen as opposing the will of God. Moreover, the Islamic notion that military and political success was the result of Allah's favor had long been successfully exploited by earlier rulers. Therefore, Timur's assertions would not have seemed unbelievable to fellow Islamic people. Topic. Period of expansion 
Timur spent the next 35 years in various wars and expeditions. He not only consolidated his rule at home by the subjugation of his foes, but sought extension of territory by encroachments upon the lands of foreign potentates. His conquests to the west and northwest led him to the lands near the Caspian Sea and to the banks of the Ural and the Volga. Conquests in the south and southwest encompassed almost every province in Persia, including Baghdad, Karbala and northern Iraq. One of the most formidable of Timur's opponents was another Mongol ruler, a descendant of Genghis Khan named Takhtemish. After having been a refugee in Timur's court, Takhtemish became ruler both of the Eastern Kipchak and the Golden Horde. After his accession, he quarreled with Timur over the possession of Khwarezm and Azerbaijan. However, Timur still supported him against the Russians and in 1382 Takhtemish invaded the Muscovite Dominion and burned Moscow. In 1395, Tamerlane reached the frontier of Principality of Ryazan, took Elitz and advancing towards Moscow came near the banks of the Don River. Great Prince Vasily I of Moscow went with an army to Kolomna and halted at the banks of the Oka River. The clergy brought the famed Theotokos of Vladimir Icon from Vladimir to Moscow. Along the way people prayed kneeling, O Mother of God, save the land of Russia. Suddenly, Tamerlane's armies retreated. In memory of this miraculous deliverance of the Russian land from Tamerlane on August 26, the all-Russian celebration in honor of the meeting of the Vladimir Icon of the Most Holy Mother of God was established. Topic. Conquest of Persia After the death of Abu Sa'id, ruler of the Ilkhanate, in 1335, there was a power vacuum in Persia. In the end, Persia was split amongst the Muzaffarids, Kardids, Aratnids, Chobanids, Injuids, Jalayarids, and Sarbadars. In 1383, Timur started his lengthy military conquest of Persia, though he already ruled over much of Persian Khorasan by 1381, after Khwaja Masid, of the Sarbadar dynasty surrendered. Timur began his Persian campaign with Herat, capital of the Kartid dynasty. When Herat did not surrender he reduced the city to rubble and massacred most of its citizens, it remained in ruins until Sharuk Mirza ordered its reconstruction. Timur then sent a general to capture rebellious Kandahar. With the capture of Herat the Kartid kingdom surrendered and became vassals of Timur, it would later be annexed outright less than a decade later in 1389 by Timur's son Miran Shah. Timur then headed west to capture the Zagros Mountains, passing through Mazandaran. During his travel through the north of Persia, he captured the then town of Tehran, which surrendered and was thus treated mercifully. He laid siege to Sultaniyah in 1384. Khorasan revolted one year later, so Timur destroyed Isfizer, and the prisoners were cemented into the walls alive. The next year the kingdom of Sistan, under the Mirabinid dynasty, was ravaged, and its capital at Zaranj was destroyed. Timur then returned to his capital of Samarkand, where he began planning for his Georgian campaign and Golden Horde invasion. In 1386, Timur passed through Mazandaran as he had when trying to capture the Zagros. He went near the city of Sultania, which he had previously captured but instead turned north and captured Tabriz with little resistance, along with Mariga. He ordered heavy taxation of the people, which was collected by Adil Aqa, who was also given control over Sultania. Adil was later executed because Timur suspected him of corruption. Timur then went north to begin his Georgian and Golden Horde campaigns, pausing his full-scale invasion of Persia. When he returned, he found his generals had done well in protecting the cities and lands he had conquered in Persia. Though many rebelled, and his son Miran Shah, who may have been regent, was forced to annex rebellious vassal dynasties, his holdings remained. So he proceeded to capture the rest of Persia, specifically the two major southern cities of Isfahan and Shiraz. When he arrived with his army at Isfahan in 1387, the city immediately surrendered, he treated it with relative mercy as he normally did with cities that surrendered, unlike Herat. However, after Isfahan revolted against Timur's taxes by killing the tax collectors and some of Timur's soldiers, he ordered the massacre of the city's citizens. The death toll is reckoned at between 100,000 and 200,000. An eyewitness counted more than 28 towers constructed of about 1,500 heads each. This has been described as a systematic use of terror against towns less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 an integral element of Tamerlane's strategic element, which he viewed as preventing bloodshed by discouraging resistance. 
His massacres were selective and he spared the artistic and educated. This would later influence the next great Persian conqueror, Nader Shah. Timur then began a five-year campaign to the west in 1392, attacking Persian Kurdistan. In 1393, Shiraz was captured after surrendering, and the Muzaffarids became vassals of Timur, though Prince Shah Mansur rebelled but was defeated, and the Muzaffarids were annexed. Shortly after Georgia was devastated so that the Golden Horde could not use it to threaten northern Iran. In the same year, Timur caught Baghdad by surprise in August by marching there in only eight days from Shiraz. Sultan Ahmad Jalayar fled to Syria, where the Mamluk Sultan Barkak protected him and killed Timur's envoys. Timur left the Sarbadar prince Khwaja Masid to govern Baghdad, but he was driven out when Ahmad Jalayar returned. Ahmad was unpopular but got some dangerous help from Kara Yusuf of the Kara Koyunlu. He fled again in 1399, this time to the Ottomans. Takhtemish Timur War In the meantime, Takhtemish, now Khan of the Golden Horde, turned against his patron and in 1385 invaded Azerbaijan. The inevitable response by Timur resulted in the Takhtemish Timur War. In the initial stage of the war, Timur won a victory at the Battle of the Kondurcha River. After the battle, Takhtemish and some of his army were allowed to escape. After Takhtemish's initial defeat, Timur invaded Muscovy to the north of Takhtemish's holdings. Timur's army burned Ryazan and advanced on Moscow. He was pulled away before reaching the Oka River by Takhtemish's renewed campaign in the south. In the first phase of the conflict with Takhtemish, Timur led an army of over 100,000 men north for more than 700 miles into the steppe. He then rode west about 1,000 miles, advancing in a front more than 10 miles wide. During this advance, Timur's army got far enough north to be in a region of very long summer days causing complaints by his Muslim soldiers about keeping a long schedule of prayers. It was then that Takhtemish's army was boxed in against the east bank of the Volga River in the Orenburg region and destroyed at the Battle of the Kondurcha River, in 1391. In the second phase of the conflict, Timur took a different route against the enemy by invading the realm of Takhtemish via the Caucasus region. In 1395, Timur defeated Takhtemish in the Battle of the Tarek River, concluding the struggle between the two monarchs. Takhtemish was unable to restore his power or prestige, and he was killed about a decade later in the area of present-day Tumen. During the course of Timur's campaigns, his army destroyed Sarai, the capital of the Golden Horde, and Astrakhan, subsequently disrupting the Golden Horde's Silk Road. The Golden Horde no longer held power after their losses to Timur. Topic. Ismailis In May 1393, Timur's army invaded the Anjudan, crippling the Ismaili village only a year after his assault on the Ismailis in Mazandaran. The village was prepared for the attack, evidenced by its fortress and system of underground tunnels. Undeterred, Timur's soldiers flooded the tunnels by cutting into a channel overhead. Timur's reasons for attacking this village are not yet well understood. However, it has been suggested that his religious persuasions and view of himself as an executor of divine will may have contributed to his motivations. The Persian historian Quandamir explains that an Ismaili presence was growing more politically powerful in Persian Iraq. A group of locals in the region was dissatisfied with this and, Quandamir writes, these locals assembled and brought up their complaint with Timur, possibly provoking his attack on the Ismailis there. Campaign against the Tughlaq dynasty In 1398, Timur invaded northern India, attacking the Delhi Sultanate ruled by Sultan Nasir ud Din Mahmud Shah Tughlaq of the Tughlaq dynasty. He was opposed by Ahirs and faced some reversals from the Jats, but the Sultanate at Delhi did nothing to stop him. After crossing the Indus River on 30 September 1398, he sacked Tulamba and massacred its inhabitants. Then he advanced and captured Multan by October. Timur crossed the Indus River at Atak now in Pakistan on the 24th of September 1398. His invasion did not go unopposed and he encountered resistance from the governor of Meerut during the march to Delhi. Timur was still able to continue his approach to Delhi, arriving in 1398 to fight the armies of Sultan Nasir ud Din Mahmud Shah Tuluk, which had already been weakened by a succession struggle within the royal family. Topic. Capture of Delhi 1398. 
The battle took place on 17 December 1398. Sultan Nasir Ud Din Mahmud Shah Tuluk and the army of Malu Iqbal had war elephants armored with chain mail and poison on their tusks. As his Tatar forces were afraid of the elephants, Timur ordered his men to dig a trench in front of their positions. Timur then loaded his camels with as much wood and hay as they could carry. When the war elephants charged, Timur set the hay on fire and prodded the camels with iron sticks, causing them to charge at the elephants howling in pain. Timur had understood that elephants were easily panicked. Faced with the strange spectacle of camels flying straight at them with flames leaping from their backs, the elephants turned around and stampeded back toward their own lines. Timur capitalized on the subsequent disruption in the forces of Nasir Ud Din Mahmud Shah Tuluk, securing an easy victory. Nasir Ud Din Mahmud Shah Tuluk fled with remnants of his forces. Delhi was sacked and left in ruins. Before the battle for Delhi, Timur executed 100,000 captives. The capture of the Delhi Sultanate was one of Timur's greatest victories, arguably surpassing the likes of Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan because of the harsh conditions of the journey and the achievement of taking down one of the richest cities at the time. After Delhi fell to Timur's army, uprisings by its citizens against the Turkic Mongols began to occur, causing a retaliatory bloody massacre within the city walls. After three days of citizens uprising within Delhi, it was said that the city reeked of the decomposing bodies of its citizens with their heads being erected like structures and the bodies left as food for the birds by Timur's soldiers. Timur's invasion and destruction of Delhi continued the chaos that was still consuming India, and the city would not be able to recover from the great loss it suffered for almost a century. Campaigns in the Levant Before the end of 1399, Timur started a war with Bayezid I, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt Nasir ad-Din Faraj. Bayezid began annexing the territory of Turkmen and Muslim rulers in Anatolia. As Timur claimed sovereignty over the Turkmen rulers, they took refuge behind him. In 1400, Timur invaded Christian Armenia and Georgia. Of the surviving population, more than 60,000 of the local people were captured as slaves, and many districts were depopulated. Then Timur turned his attention to Syria, sacking Aleppo and Damascus. The city's inhabitants were massacred, except for the artisans, who were deported to Samarkand. Timur cited the killing of Hassan ibn Ali by the Umayyad Caliph Muawiyah I and the killing of Husayn ibn Ali by Yazid I as the reason for his massacre of the inhabitants of Damascus. Timur invaded Baghdad in June 1401. After the capture of the city, 20,000 of its citizens were massacred. Timur ordered that every soldier should return with at least two severed human heads to show him. When they ran out of men to kill, many warriors killed prisoners captured earlier in the campaign, and when they ran out of prisoners to kill, many resorted to beheading their own wives. In the meantime, years of insulting letters had passed between Timur and Bayezid. Finally, Timur invaded Anatolia and defeated Bayezid in the Battle of Ankara on 20 July 1402. Bayezid was captured in battle and subsequently died in captivity, initiating the 12-year Ottoman interregnum period. Timur's stated motivation for attacking Bayezid and the Ottoman Empire was the restoration of Seljuk authority. Timur saw the Seljuks as the rightful rulers of Anatolia as they had been granted rule by Mongol conquerors, illustrating again Timur's interest with Genghizid legitimacy. After the Ankara victory, Timur's army ravaged western Anatolia, with Muslim writers complaining that the Timurid army acted more like a horde of savages than that of a civilized conqueror. But Timur did besiege and take the city of Smyrna, a stronghold of the Christian Knights Hospitallers, thus he referred to himself as Ghazi or warrior of Islam. A mass beheading was carried out in Smyrna by Timur's soldiers. Timur was furious with the Genoese and Venetians, as their ships ferried the Ottoman army to safety in Thrace. As Lord Kinross reported in the Ottoman centuries, the Italians preferred the enemy they could handle to the one they could not. While Timur invaded Anatolia, Kara Yusuf assaulted Baghdad and captured it in 1402. Timur returned to Persia from Anatolia and sent his grandson Abu Bakr ibn Miran Shah to reconquer Baghdad, which he proceeded to do. Timur then spent some time in Ardabil, where he gave Ali Safavi, leader of the Safaviyya, a number of captives. 
Subsequently, he marched to Khorasan and then to Samarkand, where he spent nine months celebrating and preparing to invade Mongolia and China. He ruled over an empire that, in modern times, extends from southeastern Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, through Central Asia encompassing part of Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and even approached Kashgar in China. The conquests of Timur are claimed to have caused the deaths of up to 17 million people, an assertion impossible to verify, of Timur's four sons, two Jahangir and Umar Sheikh predeceased him. His third son, Miran Shah, died soon after Timur, leaving the youngest son, Shah Rukh. Although his designated successor was his grandson Pir Muhammad B. Jahangir, Timur was ultimately succeeded in power by his son Shah Rukh. His most illustrious descendant Babur founded the Islamic Mughal Empire and ruled over most of Afghanistan and North India. Babur's descendants Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, expanded the Mughal Empire to most of the Indian subcontinent. Markham, in his introduction to the narrative of Clavillo's embassy, states that, after Timur died, his body was embalmed with musk and rose water, wrapped in linen, laid in an ebony coffin and sent to Samarkand, where it was buried. His tomb, the gur e amir still stands in Samarkand, though it has been heavily restored in recent years. <laughs> Attempts to attack the Ming dynasty By 1368, Han Chinese forces had driven the Mongols out of China. The first of the new Ming dynasty's emperors, the Hongwu Emperor, and his son, the Yongle Emperor, produced tributary states of many Central Asian countries. The suzerain vassal relationship between Ming Empire and Timurid existed for a long time. In 1394, Hongwu's ambassadors eventually presented Timur with a letter addressing him as a subject. He had the ambassadors Fuan, Guo Ji, and Lu Wei detained. Neither Hongwu's next ambassador, Chen Duan, nor the delegation announcing the accession of the Yongle Emperor fared any better. Timur eventually planned to invade China. To this end Timur made an alliance with surviving Mongol tribes based in Mongolia and prepared all the way to Bukhara. Enka Khan sent his grandson Olyai Timur Khan, also known as Bayanshir Khan, after he converted to Islam while at the court of Timur in Samarkand. <laughs> Death Timur preferred to fight his battles in the spring. However, he died en route during an uncharacteristic winter campaign. In December 1404, Timur began military campaigns against Ming China and detained a Ming envoy. He suffered illness while encamped on the farther side of the Syr Darya and died at Farab on February 17, 1405, before ever reaching the Chinese border. After his death the Ming envoys such as Fuan and the remaining entourage were released by his grandson Khalil Sultan. Timur was buried in Gur i Amir, his mausoleum in Samarkand. Topic. Succession Just before his death, Timur designated his grandson Pir Muhammad ibn Jahangir as his successor. However, his other descendants did not abide by this wish, and spent the next 15 years engaged in violent infighting. His son Sharuk Mirza and grandson Khalil Sultan struggled for control until Sharuk won. Topic. Exchanges with Europe Timur had numerous epistolary and diplomatic exchanges with various European states, especially Spain and France. Relations between the court of Henry III of Castile and that of Timur played an important part in medieval Castilian diplomacy. In 1402, the time of the Battle of Ankara, two Spanish ambassadors were already with Timur, Palayo de Sotomayor and Fernando de Palazuelos. Later, Timur sent to the court of the Kingdom of Leon and Castile a Chagatai ambassador named Haji Muhammad al-Qazi with letters and gifts. In return, Henry III of Castile sent a famous embassy to Timur's court in Samarkand in 1403-206, led by Rui González de Clavillo, with two other ambassadors, Alfonso Paez and Gómez de Salazar. On their return, Timur affirmed that he regarded the king of Castile as his very own son. According to Clavillo, Timur's good treatment of the Spanish delegation contrasted with the disdain shown by his host toward the envoys of the Lord of Cathay. 
i.e., the Yongle Emperor, the Chinese ruler. Clavillo's visit to Samarkand allowed him to report to the European audience on the news from Cathay, China, which few Europeans had been able to visit directly in the century that had passed since the travels of Marco Polo. The French archives preserve the 30th of July 1402 letter from Timur to Charles VI of France, suggesting that he send traitors to Asia. It is written in Persian. A May 1403 letter. This is a Latin transcription of a letter from Timur to Charles VI, and another from Miran Shah, his son, to the Christian princes, announcing their victory over Bayezid I at Smyrna. A copy has been kept of the answer of Charles VI to Timur, dated 15 June 1403. Topic. Legacy Timur's legacy is a mixed one. While Central Asia blossomed under his reign, other places, such as Baghdad, Damascus, Delhi and other Arab, Georgian, Persian, and Indian cities were sacked and destroyed and their populations massacred. He was responsible for the effective destruction of the Nestorian Christian Church of the East in much of Asia. Thus, while Timur still retains a positive image in Muslim Central Asia, he is vilified by many in Arabia, Iraq, Persia, and India, where some of his greatest atrocities were carried out. However, Ibn Khaldun praises Timur for having unified much of the Muslim world when other conquerors of the time could not. The next great conqueror of the Middle East, Nader Shah, was greatly influenced by Timur and almost re-enacted Timur's conquests and battle strategies in his own campaigns. Like Timur, Nader Shah conquered most of Caucasia, Persia, and Central Asia along with also sacking Delhi. Timur's short-lived empire also melded the Turco-Persian tradition in Transoxiana, and in most of the territories that he incorporated into his fiefdom, Persian became the primary language of administration and literary culture Dewan, regardless of ethnicity. In addition, during his reign, some contributions to Turkic literature were penned, with Turkic cultural influence expanding and flourishing as a result. A literary form of Chagatai Turkic came into use alongside Persian as both a cultural and an official language. Tamerlane virtually exterminated the Church of the East, which had previously been a major branch of Christianity but afterwards became largely confined to a small area now known as the Assyrian Triangle. Timur became a relatively popular figure in Europe for centuries after his death, mainly because of his victory over the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid. The Ottoman armies were at the time invading Eastern Europe and Timur was ironically seen as an ally. Timur has now been officially recognized as a national hero in Uzbekistan. His monument in Tashkent now occupies the place where Karl Marx's statue once stood. Muhammad Iqbal, a philosopher, poet and politician in British India who is widely regarded as having inspired the Pakistan movement, composed a notable poem entitled Dream of Timur. The poem itself was inspired by a prayer of the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah II. The Sharif of the Hiyas suffers due to the divisive sectarian schisms of his faith, and lo, that young Tatar Timur has boldly re-envisioned magnanimous victories of overwhelming conquest. In 1794, Sake Din Mahomed published his travel book, The Travels of Din Muhammad. The book begins with the praise of Genghis Khan, Timur, and particularly the first Mughal emperor, Babur. He also gives important details on the then incumbent Mughal emperor Shah Alam II. <laughs> <laughs> Historical sources The earliest known history of his reign was Nizam ad-Din Shami's Zafarnama, which was written during Timur's lifetime. Between 1424 and 1428, Sheriff ad-Din Ali Yazdi wrote a second Zafarnama drawing heavily on Shami's earlier work. Ahmad ibn Arabsha wrote a much less favorable history in Arabic. Arabsha's history was translated into Latin by the Dutch Orientalist Jacobus Golius in 1636. As Timurid sponsored histories, the two Zafarnamas present a dramatically different picture from Arabsha's chronicle. William Jones remarked that the former presented Timur as a liberal, benevolent and illustrious prince, while the latter painted him as deformed and impious, of a low birth and detestable principles. <laughs> Malfuzit i Timuri The Malfuzit i Timuri and the appended Tuik i Timuri, supposedly Timur's own autobiography, are almost certainly 17th-century fabrications. 
The scholar Abu Talib Hosseini presented the texts to the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan, a distant descendant of Timur, in 1637 38, supposedly after discovering the Chagatai language originals in the library of a Yemeni ruler. Due to the distance between Yemen and Timur's base in Transoxiana and the lack of any other evidence of the originals, most historians consider the story highly implausible, and suspect Hosseini of inventing both the text and its origin story. <laughs> European views Timur arguably had a significant impact on the Renaissance culture and early modern Europe. His achievements both fascinated and horrified Europeans from the 15th century to the early 19th century. European views of Timur were mixed throughout the 15th century, with some European countries calling him an ally and others seeing him as a threat to Europe because of his rapid expansion and brutality. When Timur captured the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid at Ankara, he was often praised and seen as a trusted ally by European rulers, such as Charles VI of France and Henry IV of England, because they believed he was saving Christianity from the Turkish Empire in the Middle East. Those two kings also praised him because his victory at Ankara allowed Christian merchants to remain in the Middle East and allowed for their safe return home to both France and England. Timur was also praised because it was believed that he helped restore the rite of passage for Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land. Other Europeans viewed Timur as a barbaric enemy who presented a threat to both European culture and the religion of Christianity. His rise to power moved many leaders, such as Henry III of Castile, to send embassies to Samarkand to scout out Timur, learn about his people, make alliances with him, and try to convince him to convert to Christianity in order to avoid war. In the introduction to a 1723 translation of Yazdi's Zafarnama, the translator wrote, M. Pettis de la Croix tells us, that there are calumnies and impostures, which have been published by authors of romances, and Turkish writers who were his enemies, and envious at his glory, among whom is Ahmed bin Arabsha. As Timur Bek had conquered the Turks and Arabians of Syria, and had even taken the Sultan Bajazit prisoner, it is no wonder that he has been misrepresented by the historians of those nations, who, in despite of truth, and against the dignity of history, have fallen into great excesses on this subject. Topic. Exhumation and alleged curse Timur's body was exhumed from his tomb on 19 June 1941 and his remains examined by the Soviet anthropologist Mikhail M. Gerasimov, Lev V. Oshinin and V. Ia. Zezenkova. It was determined that Timur was a tall and broad-chested man with strong cheek bones. At 5 feet 8 inches meters, Timur was tall for his era. The examinations confirmed that Timur was lame and had a withered right arm due to his injuries. His right thigh bone had knitted together with his kneecap, and the configuration of the knee joint suggests that he had kept his leg bent at all times and therefore would have had a pronounced limp. Gerasimov reconstructed the likeness of Timur from his skull and found that Timur's facial characteristics displayed mongoloid features with some Caucasoid admixture. Oceanin also concluded that Timur's cranium showed predominantly the characteristics of a South Siberian mongoloid type. It is alleged that Timur's tomb was inscribed with the words, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. It is also said that when Gerasimov exhumed the body, an additional inscription inside the casket was found, which read, Whomsoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. In any case, three days after Gerasimov began the exhumation, Adolf Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the largest military invasion of all time, upon the Soviet Union. Timur was reburied with full Islamic ritual in November 1942 just before the Soviet victory at the Battle of Stalingrad. In the arts Tamburlaine the Great, Parts 1 and 2 English, 1563-1594, play by Christopher Marlowe Tamerlane, 1701, play by Nicholas Rowe English Tamerlano, 1724, opera by George Frederick Handel, in Italian, based on the 1675 play Tamerlane o la morte de Bajazet by Jacques Pradin. Bajazet 1735, opera by Antonio Vivaldi, portrays the capture of Bayezid I by Timur Il Gran Tamerlano 1772, opera by Joseph Mislavicek that also portrays the capture of Bayezid I by Timur Tamerlane, first published poem of Edgar Allan Poe American, 1809-1849 
Timur is the deposed, blind former king of Tartary and father of the protagonist Kalaf in the opera Tarandit by Giacomo Puccini, libretto by Giuseppe Adami and Renato Simoni. Tamerlane 1928, historical novel by Harold Lamb. Timur appears in the story Lord of Samarkand by Robert E. Howard. Tamerlan, novel by Colombian writer Enrique Serrano in Spanish Tamburlaine, Shadow of God, a BBC Radio 3 play by John Fletcher, broadcast 2008, is a fictitious account of an encounter between Tamburlaine, Ibn Khaldun, and Hafez. Gallery Consorts Timur had 43 consorts Termish Aga, mother of Jahangir Mirza, Jahansha Mirza and aka Begi Oljay Turkan Aga M. daughter of Amir Mashla and granddaughter of Amir Kazahan Saray Mulk Kanem M. widow of Amir Husayn, and daughter of Kazan Khan Islam Aga M. 1367, widow of Amir Husayn, and daughter of Amir Bayan Salduts Ulu's Aga M. 1367, widow of Amir Husayn, and daughter of Amir Khazir Yusuri. Dilshad Aga M. 1374, daughter of Shams ed Din and his wife Bujan Aga. Tuman Aga M. 1377, daughter of Amir Musa and his wife Arzu Mulk Aga, daughter of Amir Bayezid Jalayir. Chulpan Mulk Aga, daughter of Haji Beg of Jeddah. Tukal Kanem M. 1395, daughter of Mongol Khan Khazir Kawaja Oglan Tolan Aga, concubine, and mother of Umar Sheikh Mirza I Mungli Aga, concubine, and mother of Miran Shah ibn Timur Togay Turkan Aga, lady from the Kara Kitai, widow of Amir Husayn, and mother of Sharuk Mirza ibn Timur Tudi Bey Aga, daughter of Aq Sufi Kongarat Sultan Aray Aga, Anuka's lady Malakansha Aga, a Filuni lady Khand Malik Aga, mother of Ibrahim Mirza Sultan Aga, mother of a son who died in infancy, his other wives and concubines included Dalit Tarkhan Aga, Burhan Aga, Yani Beg Aga, Tini Beg Aga, Dur Sultan Aga, Mundas Aga, Bakht Sultan Aga, Nowruz Aga, Jahan Bakht Aga, Nigar Aga, Ruparwar Aga, Dil Beg Aga, Dilshad Aga, Murad Beg Aga, Piruzbakht Aga, Kashkeldi Aga, Dilkash Aga, Barat Bey Aga, Savinch Malik Aga, Arzu Bey Aga, Yadgar Sultan Aga, Kudadad Aga, Bakht Nigar Aga, Kutlu Bey Aga, and another Nigar Aga. Topic. Descendants of Timur Topic. Sons of Timur Jahangir Mirza ibn Timur, with Termish Aga Umar Sheikh Mirza I, with Tolan Aga Miran Shah ibn Timur, with Mungli Aga Sharuk Mirza ibn Timur, with Togay Turkan Aga Topic. Daughters of Timur A.K.A. Begi, married to Muhammad Bey, son of Amir Musa, with Termish Aga Unknown, married to Soliman Mirza, mother unknown Unknown, married to Kumaleza Mirza, mother unknown Sultan Bakht Begum, married firstly Muhammad Morik, married secondly, 1389 90 Solomon Shah, with Ol J. Turkan Aga Topic. Sons of Jahangir Muhammad Sultan bin Jahangir Mirza PIR Muhammad bin Jahangir Mirza Topic Sons of Umar Sheikh Mirza I PIR Muhammad ibn Umar Sheikh Mirza I Iskander ibn Umar Sheikh Mirza I Rustam ibn Umar Sheikh Mirza I Baykara ibn Umar Sheikh Mirza I Mansur ibn Baykara Husayn ibn Mansur bin Baykara Badi al Zaman Muhammad Mumin Muzaffar Hussein Ibrahim Hussein Topic Sons of Miran Shah Khalil Sultan ibn Miran Shah Abu Bakr ibn Miran Shah 
Muhammad ibn Miran Shah, Abu Sa'id Mirza, Umar Sheikh Mirza II, Zahir ud Din Muhammad Babur, The Mughals, Jahangir Mirza II. Topic. Sons of Sharuk Mirza Mirza Muhammad Taraheh, better known as Ula Beg, Abdul Latif, Jiath al Din Basankor, Allah ud Dalla Mirza ibn Basankor, Ibrahim Mirza, Sultan Muhammad ibn Basankor, Yadagar Muhammad, Mirza Abul Qasim Babur ibn Basankor, Sultan Ibrahim Mirza Abdullah Mirza Mirza Soyurgatmish Khan Mirza Muhammad Juki See also Ahmad Jalayar Global Empire Harold Lamb, author of the historical novel Tamerlane List of the Muslim Empires Muslim Conquest in the Indian Subcontinent Tamerlane play Tamerlane chess Timurid dynasty Timurlingia Topic Notes Topic References Nobler, Adam 1995 The Rise of Timur and Western Diplomatic Response 1390 to 1405 Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, Third Series, 5, 3, 341 to 349. Nobler, Adam, 2001. Timur the Terrible Tartar Trope: A Case of Repositioning in Popular Literature and History. Medieval Encounters, 7, 1, 101 to 112. May, Timothy. Timur, the Lame, 1336 to 1405. The Encyclopedia of War. Morosi, Justin, Tamerlane, Sword of Islam, Conqueror of the World, London, HarperCollins, 2004. Morosi, Justin, Tamerlane, in The Art of War, Great Commanders of the Ancient and Medieval World, Andrew Roberts, Editor, London, Quirkus Military History, 2008. ISBN 978 1 84724 259 4. Beatrice Forbes Manns. Timur and the Problem of a Conqueror's Legacy. Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, Third Series, Volume 8, Number 1, April 1998. Abazov, Rafis. Timur, Tamerlane, and the Timurid Empire in Central Asia. Quote. The Palgrave Concise Historical Atlas of Central Asia. Palgrave Macmillan, U.S., 2008. 56 to 57. Yuxil, Musa Samil. Timuran Yuxalisi v Batinine Diplomatic Savabi, 1390-1405, Selçuk Universitesi Turkiyat Aristirmalari Dergisi 1.18 231-243. Sturenshis, Michael V. Approach to Tamerlane, Tradition and Innovation, Central Asia and the Caucasus II Marlowe, Christopher, Tamerlane the Great. Ed. J. S. Cunningham. Manchester University Press, Manchester 1981. Novoseltsev, A.P. On the Historical Evaluation of Tamerlane, Soviet Studies in History 12.3 37–70. Sykes, P.M. Tamerlane, Journal of the Central Asian Society 2.1 17–33. This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Chisholm, Hugh, ed. 1911. Timur. Encyclopædia Britannica. 26 11th ed. Cambridge University Press. Topic external links Timur at Encyclopædia Britannica Forbes, Andrew, and Henley, David, Timur's Legacy, The Architecture of Bukhara and Samarkand CPA Media Narrative of the Embassy of Rui González de Clavillo to the Court of Timur, at Samarkand, AD 1403-6 Full text at Google Books. Rui González de Clavillo, Embassy to Tamerlane, 1403-1406, translated by Guy Lestrange, with a new introduction by Caroline Stone Hardened Simple, 2009. Nationality or Religion, Views of Central Asian Islam